everyone, welcome to the Team Yume podcast live on video. Except not live, but it is indeed on video. I am Madog Die Master, your perennial host. You will never get rid of me. <laughs> Yay! And I am the proverbial guest Y Boy. I ask questions and I review animation. You're more That's like my entire existence. The co host at this point in time. Oh, yay! You've <laughs> yeah, been got promoted! By the way, yay. you are hearing a very loud noise of a fan right on my left because it is necessary for me to live at this point. <laughs> yeah. We've been struck by a recent heat wave here in Italy and usually these recordings go about an hour long and I need to keep myself sharp. Yeah. And the fan is the only way for me not to die. <laughs> so, uh, yes, bear with the background noise. Imagine <laughs> it is some sort of Tranquil, relaxing river, you know, to calm it could be just nerves. A, it could be just an ASMR track. Just put the microphone up to up to it. And I'm then it's trying for, for to paint a romantic visage. Don't ruin my romantic visage, why boy? But come on, people! People listen to that stuff all the time for the ASMR effect, and they get millions of views. Okay, I'm going to place my microphone directly in front of the fan, see how you like it. I will not do that. <laughs> Alright, so we have a few interesting little topics of discussion tonight. Basically, we are going to do a, a YouTube animation-themed podcast, because coincidentally, it just so happened that I've come across a, quite a few good animations that are currently available on YouTube, and I chatted about it with uh, Y Boy, which is in between me, him, and the VAR about uh, the third most enthusiastic person about cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess that would be it. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, and the way you were discussing it to me, we were doing Bloody Bunny. Uh, we transition we'll very it. smoothly to uh, Doodle Tunes. Yeah. And then Raised by Zombies, which is the one that I actually had watched beforehand. Yes. <laughs> um, you spoiled it already. It was going to be a surprise. But anyway, yes. <laughs> Before we jump right into that, uh, a bit of a premise here. So recently I finally had the chance to watch uh, Animal Olympics. It has... Um, right. I bet you know about that, knowing you. Yeah, I do. I have not watched it, but I knew about it. I know you. I know my why, boy. I know weird animations. <laughs> no, uh, because you're a furry. <laughs> Isn't that, is that kind well. of an entry-level seminar work for uh, wannabe furries, you know? <laughs> I, I guess. I don't even know. I'm okay, not... so um, <laughs> I surprisingly don't have that much to say about Animal Olympics, but I will say this, that in spite of its glaring problems, including crippling pacing, um, lack of a real story, lackluster comedy, and casual racism just thrown there because it's the 1980s, in spite of all that, the animation is so genuinely good that uh, that almost doesn't matter. If you view this film as an example of what the most talented people in the animation industry, with the right budget, can concoct, then this is probably one of the most uh, brilliant examples of uh, fluid animation in that regard. Fluid, creative, almost unbridled, but of high quality. Definitely a benchmark of uh, what can be accomplished uh, within this field and this medium for its days. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, for most decades in general, 
It is surprisingly, almost criminally good to look at. Why does Animalympics of all films look so good? <laughs> yes. It's so unfair. <laughs> I don't know, uh, just sometimes really unamazing stories get really good animation. Can we just talk about the fact that at some point what is supposed to be the skirmish event, because this is a parody of the Olympics, as the name suggests, turns inexplicably into an episode of Zorro with La Contessa just uh, clamoring into the scene, challenging the victor for his gold medal. <laughs> Sportsmanship doesn't work like that. <laughs> Yeah, it's just the sort of thing. It's like we need a we need a little subplot here. Throw it in there. There we go. I mean, Drama. we have theoretically a million subplots, but never really a plot, <laughs> which again, it's weird. Yeah, definitely. Although I will admit, Rene and Kit Mambo ending up together in such a cute way, it's it makes it uh, worth it. Honestly. I particularly enjoyed the um, inevitable Rene's trippy psychedelic uh, <laughs> scene <laughs> that becomes a metaphor for his entire life. The characters aren't exactly uh, well developed, but they occasionally do get these little trippy psychedelic scenes that completely break the flow of the story and they're clearly there to pad out the length of the film. Yeah, But they do get these little scenes that uh, pretty much explain what these characters are supposed to be all about. So at least we get that. That's good. Speaking of cartoon animals, let's uh, use this occasion to um, smoothly transition into the first topic of tonight's discussion. Because yes, Animal Olympics has anthropomorphic animals. Duh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is Bloody Bunny. <laughs> what do we know about Bloody Bunny? Well, well, I mixed it up with another Flash animated series that I watched way back on Newgrounds days called Bunny Kill. I just is, mixed them up. It is a surprising coincidence given that both series, or at least both franchises, conceptually feature a uh, stuffed animal bunny, or a rabbit plushie, if you will, that uh, slaughters people. And that yeah. would be the meat and substance of Bloody Bunny. And really all you need to know, it's a franchise in which there is a bunny who's bloody. It's in the title, Bloody Bunny. But apparently there is lore behind it. Yeah, there's a lot of lore that's just spoken through like zero dialogue and just all visuals of it, which I thought was really well done in Bloody Bunny. Uh, I, felt. I had to... I had For to... minute-long pieces? I mean... What do you think? I had to vehemently oppose to that statement, but first of all, let's establish what uh, exactly of Bloody Bunny we witnessed, because there are several things, animated things, as it were, related to Bloody Bunny. First of, Bloody Bunny, the character itself, it was created by a Thailandese company called Two Spot. And uh, it's not an animation studio, it's a character design company, which means they just uh, create characters and then they proceed to market them so that they can make money off of the marketing of the character itself. Merchandising, franchising, and also there are animations too. Those animations are made by completely different studios, obviously. Uh, I see. <laughs> That is interesting, because I actually did some research on how many mascot characters are, like, developed in that region of the world. So, Bloody Bunny was one of those? Yes, uh, Bloody Bunny is the most famous character of the two-spot company in question, which got me interested in trying to discover more. Well, go, go, I'm just doing recording right now. Sorry. 
No problem. I don't know which underwear it is. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, God. Isn't that the stereotypical way that a mother enters the room? <laughs> Just barges through the door to ask about your underwear. So last time it was my mother, this time it's yours. Yeah. This is a running gag, everybody. It's far more effectual than any time I try to shoehorn Goosey into this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, at least there are no dogs around. Anyway, as I was about to say, researching about Bloody Bunny definitely had me interested in finding more about the fairly unknown Thailandese animation scene which led me to find out about more Flash animations starring Bloody Bunny. For example, there is the crossover with the singer Ayupan, titled Ayupan Cross Bloody Bunny, which is a six episodes Flash animation, and it's really scandalously cheap. Yeah. <laughs> but boy, they use every trick in the book to make all the fight scenes look actually action-packed, including those classic tricks that Osamu Tezuka perfected, or dare I say invented, back in the 60s when he made Astro Boy. <laughs> Which is almost like a, a lesson of animation history to me. They would use, so often, super dramatic panning and zooming of the camera to give us the illusion of something that's actually happening but in reality, mm -hmm. they're just shaking the camera, or, you know, the animation equivalent of that. Yeah. <laughs> also, speaking of cheap, Ayuban Cross Bloody Bunny as the most hilariously bad, out-of-sync English dub since the whatever awful Malaysian English dub they had in the 80s for anime. <laughs> it's amazing yeah. and there is a dog yeah there's a dog <laughs> you is, jinxed it before is this a bad time to record <laughs> it's always a bad time to record when a dog in the house So, <laughs> I'll kill you. <laughs> okay, so uh, to make a long story short, uh, you should watch it because it's so bad, but so funny because of that. The English dub alone is outstanding. I mean, voice synchronization. Mm -hmm. This chimera. One day, the mighty gods above will grant us the knowledge to master this forbidden art. But until then, we have Ayupan Cross Bloody Bunny. <laughs> Preposterous. Yeah. And there is also an original uh, version in Thailandese of the show, so uh, I checked it out too. The dub is not much better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's clear that uh, whomever made this, they just started out in many ways yeah. and did not have any budget whatsoever. Which, again, it makes me even more curious about the Thailandese animation scene because it begs the question if that nation ever had one to begin with. In that case, is Bloody Bunny their own Astro Boy? I don't know, honestly. <laughs> but Ayupan Cross Bloody Bunny although it's an interesting topic in its own right, it is not the very specific Bloody Bunny show we were going to dissect. No, no, what I made him watch is actually something far superior in terms of both budget and animation. It is almost a completely different beast. It is honestly possibly the best looking CG animated series I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's Bloody Bunny CG edition. It definitely more has a story to it. Like, I'm, 
a more laid out story in a sense. Even I though mean, each basically each episode is like a minute long and just following Bloody Bunny and her little sister who's in this little bunny head thing as they're just trying to go around and such. So there is a story, technically, in the most technical just light sense of the word. Yeah. There is lore behind it, but you will be hard pressed in understanding it or even following it because the show is too concerned in shoving as many, as many gory, fast paced action scenes to your face as much as it can for you to understand anything at all. It's just action followed by action followed by some more action with a side <laughs> dish of action and also to drink gore. Yeah, actually, that makes it a lot similar to to Bunny Kill in a lot of ways because if you actually had watched any of those like text scrolls that had on its flash animations, there's actually like a narrative behind everything of him be being a li little little hitman. Just trying to complete his mission and such. And the same thing is here, but I feel that there is the light line of a story in there. Like the very beginning, Bunny Kill becomes Bunny Kill, she gets into the body, she saves the little wait, sister. Wait, 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 Bunny Kill becomes Bunny Kill? What? I don't know what her name is. They don't. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, they have no name. I mean, there is Bloody Bunny. And then but, there uh, are... I, I, yeah, why am I saying bunny? I keep mixing up bunny kill and bloody bunny. <laughs> the, the names are too similar, okay? <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> so... Okay, so like I said many times, and it's time to finally expand on that, there is lore behind mm -hmm. all of this. And I had to read it up in order to understand it. So, you know, that's no good. Yeah. Um, like I said, there is no time to expand on anything, characters, motivations for said characters, their story, and the overarching story behind all that, none of that matters because it is action, 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 blood buff, and action. And the show gets really creative about certain ways in which said action sequences are conveyed including the very first uh, violent outburst, which is basically like playing Doom. Yes, it's yeah. a first-person slaughter fest. It's the only time they do that, but it fits with the moment. Anyway, mm -hmm. the lore. There are at least two known lores, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know about Bloody Bunny. They are completely contrasting with each other and uh, they are basically all for different stories. I mean, in the end, Two Spot just created the character design and then everyone else said, I'm going to take this character and I'm going to write my own fan fiction for it. <laughs> So, but the most prominent piece of a story about Bloody Bunny actually is the one that's applied to the Bloody Bunny shorts that we actually watched. And it's surprisingly dark, because we are in a world where we have uh, living toys, dolls, or puppets, or what have you, yeah. living plushy animals. Yeah. Um, that uh, exist at the same time as humans. And there is this uh, factory in which uh, little girls are kidnapped. They are actually used to make dolls. So that's really dark. Yeah. They are like thrown, literally thrown into grinding machines their bones ground and their blood is used to make new, uh, I guess, living dolls? Yeah. I can sense a series of interesting commentaries about uh, child abuse, uh, female objectification, and all of that. But we ain't got time for that because Bloody Bunny has to kill things! 
Yeah. Yeah. So Bloody Bunny immediately jumps out into killing everybody in the factory and such. It's supposed then, to be a uh, revenge story. Yeah, revenge story and also just setting up the rest of the 14 episodes. They set it up with action, followed up yeah. by more action. I'm saying action too many times, but you get the picture. It's mm -hmm. all a continued, never-stopping, freaking bloodbath. Yeah. It's like Kill Bill, the Bunny edition, but uh, only the action scenes. And if they were anime, essentially. <laughs> if, if I had to put it as simply as this, I will. But, like I said, there are contrasting lures about Bloody Bunny, as well as there is an issue concerning the gender of Bloody Bunny. And I know what you might be thinking right now. Mad Dog, you magnificent and handsome bastard. <laughs> we are talking about a freaking living plushie of a lagomorph. Why would you care about gender? I don't. That is the answer. But, but, if you see the story for these shorts... Bloody Bunny originally was the soul of a girl who was put into the meat grinder and uh, possessed the body of uh, the plush bunny and then she's on a quest for revenge. Straightforward. But then there are also other pieces of writing and text, um, especially if you go to the website of To Spot in glorious broken English, that say that Bloody Bunny is a male, because they use the male pronoun. Like I said, it's all in broken English, so <laughs> they might just have gotten the pronoun wrong. But I'm not quite sure. Maybe the Bloody Bunny in Ayupan Cross Bloody Bunny was male? I don't know. Everything about this is a bit confusing. <laughs> When I watched the Flash anime and then CG one, I I just got girl out of both of them. It's clearly supposed to be a girl in uh, this uh, show that we watched because, again, it's the soul of a girl that gets into the plush bunny, so technically it's female. But maybe other versions are not so sure. Or maybe <laughs> it's just two spot uh, not being good at English. That could also be the case. Yeah, but it could just be a character consistency issue, where between each property is just handled differently. For and some like reason. I said, to spot, they just made uh, the character. They did not uh, make stories for it. Well, I guess they made a lore for it, a basic lore, but uh, it was pretty much taken as liberally as possible by whomever made cartoons out of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is also another, a third Flash animation starring Bloody Bunny that I found on YouTube. Unfortunately, that one does not have a English translation, so you can only watch it in Japanese audio. <laughs> because it has Japanese audio and it must be a Japanese anime at that point. Mm -hmm. I am not quite sure because finding information safe information about uh, Bloody Bunny proved to be surprisingly difficult. So let's just talk about what we have in our hands right now, figuratively speaking. So let's talk about the animation in the CG I, yes. Bloody Bunny, serious, <laughs> unnecessary pause. Like yes. I said, it's actually really really good surprisingly really good it has uh, a good flow every action sequence has a series of interesting details to it they have variety they are creative they are bloody you know yeah. so that's one promise maintained by the title yeah. it also has a really interesting aesthetic you know, there's this overabundance of uh, primary colors, such as red and black, 
which incidentally are the colors of angst. <laughs> yeah, really as soon as you do... just hear the title Bloody Bunny, you, you know what, what exactly what you're going to get. I would argue it's not as like basic as like Bunny Kill was, because that was literally just a bunny just stabbing a bunch of people. And this one at least has the motivation. Well, of, again, of we had to bunny use a lot of quotation marks here, because it has the potential to be a full-fledged compelling story but uh, they only focused on making essentially a series of action scenes loosely connected with each other by the drive for revenge of the main character and that's really about it that's really all yeah. bloody bunny is in this uh, context now uh, there is more of a proper properly established and focused narrative if you watch mm -hmm. the ayupan across bloody bunny show but that has a whole other bag of problems <laughs> hysterical <laughs> yeah. yeah from when i watch like yeah it definitely is hysterical but i would more recommend the cg one yes because i, I do mean, think it definitely is the more more eye-catching of an animation short yes, series i mean from a purely animation standpoint this is really really nice to look at well animated they clearly had a massive budget for this one all the animations that we are discussing tonight are available for free really if you're in the mood of some good old-fashioned action-oriented gore fest which just so happened to be uh, ironically just opposed with something that's inherently cute and adorable and fluffy yeah. Then Bloody Bunny is that show that's made specifically and weirdly enough for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I would agree that's about there. it. There are no dialogues, as we said before. There is no real sense of pacing because, again, it is all continued action with essentially no break. It hits the ground running, it never stops. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's always moving. It always definitely, moving. It definitely has to be like that if they started off as just minute-long episodes. I mean, it now it's like you got to keep running till the minute mark. Pretty much. Yeah. On to the next one, which I did not plan for this. Coincidentally, also stars a bunny in it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so me. from the high-quality, high-budgeted really good looking professional animation of bloody bunny we shall jump right into the polar opposite of that and we discover a cartoon that uh, judging simply by looking at it it is clear that uh, whomever is animating this just started now there was a time for me and i'm sure it's the same for many of you that I used to watch cartoons on Newgrounds.com somewhere in the mid-2000s or even before that. Have you yes. ever watched anything on Newgrounds.com? <laughs> oh, yeah, all the time about... I did. Of course you did. I, I spent all my time on there when I was younger. I'm sure you watched all the Omstar Runners. <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah, all of those other shows. Um, all of the other things too. <laughs> yeah, I mostly watch Mario parodies, honestly. Yeah, there was course. a ton of them. What was great about Newgrounds at the time was that it was the platform for many amateur animators to start. And uh, even though those very first few cartoons they made would look ugly compared to the cartoons they would make a few years down the line. It was still interesting and definitely uh, involving to see them grow as artists, but also to keep in mind where they started. We don't get yeah, to witness something like that as much anymore, because when we watch cartoons on YouTube, usually we get uh, something that looks great already, because Whomever made it uh, is a really talented individual who had a lot of practice and they are making their thesis film because they are graduating from CalArts 
and all of that. <laughs> oh, look at me, I'm so good at things. I'm a graduate at Kellers. I'm such a talented individual. I wish you all the best, by the way. Uh, so we are used to already see the end of a journey, so to speak, of an animator when they are starting to make their work available on YouTube for free. We have people who have already grown as animators. It doesn't happen often or not as much anymore to witness somebody who just started, who is actually making something that resembles one of those early Newgrounds animations because of how amateurish they look. And that's not necessarily mm -hmm. detrimental because, hey, everybody has to start somewhere. So yeah. uh, these people who are just starting out on their own venture are putting themselves out there. And even though their initial works don't look very good, they still have that charmingly amateurish quality to them because mm -hmm. it means that they are starting out again, which leaves room for improvement, for growth. And uh, to me, this is perfectly exemplified by a web series titled Doodle Tunes. Whoa there! Are you out of your mind? This is dangerous! Belly, danger is an anagram for garden. Gardens are safe places, therefore, this is safe. Hey, I thought you dogs loved bones. That, uh, is a crude, tasteless stereotype. <laughs> Which is available on the Clever Clover Productions YouTube channel. If you're looking at the dictionary for the very definition of amateur, this is it. But I don't mean it, again, in a negative light. Watching these cartoons, I feel like I'm thrown back to the early days of Newgrounds and those early animations that were pretty ugly, using whatever version of Adobe Flash they had at the time, <laughs> with a bloody TV format as opposed to widescreen, and an overabundance of stock sound effects. Yeah. <laughs> because they couldn't make their own music or sound effects. <laughs> Doodle Tunes has all of that in spades. It is so, so beginner level. Yeah. And I love it because of that. It has all the qualities and all the flaws of a beginner level animation. I sound sarcastic. I am not. I legitimately enjoy this. Both for nostalgic reasons and also because it is humbling and uh, a nice change of pace, a nice change of perspective, if you will, yeah. to witness indubitably a young artist <laughs> who just wants to make cartoons and is learning by actually doing them. Mm -hmm. So good job on that. I wanted to talk about uh, Doodle Tunes for a long time, but I never actually had the chance to. Um, you've seen a few episodes, have you? Yeah, yeah, I've seen, seen a few episodes. I, I went back to the days where, where he started off as Cartoon Lover 98, which I thought was like a perfect sort of early internet name. <laughs> Yes, well... Just all, all those random numbers and such. And he definitely has a really, really, a really unique style to it. It definitely feels like one of those older, older age cartoons. <laughs> and it definitely has a, a lot of references to modern day cartoons as well. Like how the bunny lives in, in, a, in a banana house. Just like how Spongebob Squarepants lives in a pineapple house. Yes, okay, so like I said before, the protagonist uh, is a bunny. Uh, he also has a friend, which I think is a dingo, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And uh, there are also um, a full cast of other wacky characters, including the obligatory girlfriend slash rule uh, 63 version of him. 
because that's how female characters were designed back in the old days of animation. Okay, so this uh, Doodle Toon series clearly is going for a postmodern parody, almost a satire in some cases of uh, Golden Age cartoons. Yeah. Of uh, cartoons in general, but with a more prominent attention to how they used to be. And uh, it is clear to me that uh, certain choices, certain stylistic choices, are not just the product of uh, limited uh, uh, tools. The use of stock sound effects, it is so overabundant and overflowing that it is clear to me that it is supposed to be as in your face as possible yeah and when i say stock audio effects i mean uh, you know classic sounds from uh, primarily looney tunes cartoons and also yeah, surprisingly just... the flintstones yeah it is the bonks the running sound effects all those sort of classic noises are just yes. reused reused for a lot of these shorts yes uh, musical cues background music um, all stock sound effects that are publicly available at this point, I believe. Yeah. For the most part. And that's interesting, again. Aesthetically speaking, uh, like I said before, charmingly amateurish, early new grounds, visual flesh animation style. It is a proper throwback because uh, there were many flash cartoons back in the day that were already proactively trying to uh, spoof or satirize certain well-known animation tropes when it concerns uh, old cartoons and cartoons in general. So uh, this person is basically keeping up with the tradition and trying to add to the uh, legacy in his own right. Mm -hmm. is making cartoons to make fun of uh, cliches about cartoons. And uh, it, being an amateur, only makes them more valuable in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Oh, by the way, this person goes by the name of Jack on Twitter, so I'll refer to him as Jack. I've seen his illustrations, they are actually very well drawn. It is clear to me that he was a um, comic artist before venturing into animation. So mm -hmm. he has a starting point uh, with illustrations and he's trying to veer into making proper cartoons. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the Ah Shut Up episode? Yeah. <laughs> it is a, a primary example of a uh, both what works and what doesn't in his cartoons. First of all, the hunter that comes out and says, Wabbit, Wabbit, that's clearly an obviously lifted model or yeah. something else. Yeah, it's a little bit on the nose there. <laughs> yes, but again, it is so on the nose, it has a big nose coincidentally, that <laughs> I think we are meant to notice it. It seems like there is this very fine and surprisingly blurry line in between uh, things done out of necessity and things done because they were meant to be like that. And when uh, these two things uh, meet each other in the middle, you cannot quite be sure if uh, things ended up in a certain way because mistakes were made and he's trying to cover it up by saying it's postmodern, you guys, I totally meant it or if it's actually clever and when I see this episode my doubts are overflowing because these cartoons have been made recently, okay? This latest cartoon, I think, was made either uh, in the tail end of 2016 or already in 2017 mm-hmm this cartoon has black faces. Yeah. yeah, from what I could tell from some of Jack's videos, he definitely likes to go for those sort of raunchy sort of jokes. 
Like yes. there is this big online animator called Animated James, and he has a video where he's making fun of his fart fetish. Yeah, I am subscribed to Animated James, so I honestly have never seen any fart jokes in any of his cartoons, so I don't know what he's talking about. Actually, there is one fart joke in one of his earlier ones, but that's neither here nor there. It's basically, a, it was basically a cartoon made in response to Anime Jane's coming out, basically saying, like, yes, I do make these fart comics on the side and such, because it's just something I like. He made it sort of a parody of one of those old Golden Age cartoons, just like, oh, golly, I gotta go get the girl. I wonder how I should sway her. Yes. Mm. And so the little this... character goes up, farts in the girl's face. Okay, so... Now, back to the black faces, because we cannot ignore it. I am conflicted about this, because on one hand... Yeah. Why would you do that? And on the other hand, yes, yes, I get it. It's because old cartoons were racist. I mean, they had black faces, they had yellow faces, they had red faces, they had all the color spectrum faces, <laughs> yeah. if you want. Old cartoons were perfectly acceptable in their own period of time, but several elements about them are not considered acceptable in today's society, and for good mm -hmm. reasons. So, in a way, yes, if you're going to uh, make fun of old cartoons, if you're going to do a postmodern deconstruction of uh, old cartoons, you cannot afford to shy away from their biggest most glaring problems. And in that sense, adding black faces as a result of a character getting shot in the face multiple times, because that's what causes black faces in all cartoons if they are not actually supposed to be black characters. Even keeping that in mind, they feel gratuitous, don't they? Yeah. They yeah. feel they are being put there for shock value and without much thought behind them. And again, this all arcans back to the fact that this is supposed to be a amateur animator who is also clearly an amateur in developing his own sense of humor. Again, it's one of those things that made him charming to yeah. me. But there are limitations. I don't think this was a good idea, mm -hmm. but it could have been a good idea if framed correctly yeah. with a very specific amount of tact that uh, somebody who just started making cartoons yeah. can't possibly have developed yet. I personally don't really feel that it's an issue of him being an amateur and such. I feel like the idea of being an amateur means that he had no idea what he was doing when adding that. No, uh, when wait. He, and... uh, when, I, when I say amateur, I don't mean he had... <laughs> no idea what he was doing. He clearly no, did I, have every idea I, of what I, he was doing. I, I know that. I'm just more reiterating as just sort of like my thoughts on it. He definitely likes, like his humor is a lot more of a raunchier humor mixed with the golden cartoons. So we can have that episode where the girl's going to commit suicide and the character's crying, wait! Yes, because that was fine. a thing! Because that was yeah. a thing back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> that was a thing. But when the raunchiness of those suicide... It. I get the joke, stuff. and it's funny. I get the joke, and it's funny. Because, yes, that's what happened in all cartoons. Let's make fun of it by reproducing... Just doing the same joke. Exactly what they did. Again, that subtle blurry line in between uh, actual parody or, you know, just remaking yeah. old cartoons that becomes a bit uh, confusing. Yeah. Do you see why I wanted to talk about this one? Because yeah. I have mixed feelings about it and I like it, but I cannot be sure if it's actually brilliant or if it's actually just, you know, ill-conceived. But in any case, yeah. we still need to keep in mind the fact that this person, this Jack, these are his very first cartoons. And time will only tell how he will improve, mm -hmm. or if he'll improve at all, and uh, all of that. How long has he been making cartoons, actually? 
<laughs> not guess... very long. I mean, if I've seen his YouTube channel, I think it's been active only ever since last year. Uh, yeah. So... yeah. Because I was looking at it, it's like I saw a Cartoon Lover 98, and I was just thinking, like, wow, that feels like one from 20, a name of 2012 or something. It just feels yes. a little bit off to me. Yeah, they do look like they've come out 10 years ago, because uh, clearly the program he's using is very old. Mm -hmm. Cartoons made today with uh, tools available today, even if they are completely amateurish, they are not allowed to look like this anymore. Yeah. It's a very specific old Adobe Flash aesthetics <laughs> that uh, don't exist anymore, unless you have an old Adobe Flash program that's completely outdated. So it would be interesting to know more about that. Yeah, definitely. I really don't think he's really very hardly trying to parody the Golden Age cartoons. It feels like he's just trying to recreate them. And that feels... Yeah. And I, and I, can, I can see the joys in that, because he did have those sort of classic episodes, like where the bunnies, after you do a long clock, just wants to shut up so he can get some extra sleep. Those are very classic cartoon tropes. And yes. Tropes done in the Golden Age. Yeah. Like, we made for the modern day, people will still like them. I'm saying this because I'm trying to justify the black faces. I mean, if it's a parody, if it is a postmodern parody, then I can sort of see why the black faces are there. If they're not, and it's just remaking old cartoon tropes because it just enjoys old cartoons, and who doesn't? Even with all their problems, they are still where we all come from as <laughs> fans of animation. But in that case, don't redo the black faces. Don't yeah. <laughs> remake the black faces. It ruins a perfectly enjoyable cartoon. Yeah, it adds a bit more raunchiness to your cartoon than than what it's trying to open up as. <laughs> because at the end of the day, I still recommend it if you feel nostalgic about Newgrounds uh, early cartoon animations and what mm -hmm. have you. And, uh, you know, if you would like to see a different, somewhat modern take on old cartoons. With yeah. so many, so many stock sound effects. <laughs> it's almost obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would recommend it for the exact same sort of reasons. Even though it's not really a series that I feel that I will stick with, the quality is just not really there to basically make me intrigued to really want to just keep coming back to for new episodes. But, like I said, I think that is what uh, drew me in because, wow, this looks like it's legitimately 10 years old. It's been made now? Really? With that TV format? And that 2003 Adobe Flash program or whatever yeah. simulacra animation program he's using? <laughs> yeah. Wow. I cannot stop watching it. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely sort of an acquired taste sort of cartoon. It is charming. Amateurishly yeah. charming. I think that summarizes it. It is an amateurishly charming little show. Mm -hmm. Okay, talking about Doodle Tunes was surprisingly difficult for some reason. <laughs> so let's cut back to something that's way more interesting, but also way more straightforward to talk about. Now, I have a question for you, why boy. Me giving a question for you. <laughs> You know, is it a why, why question? Boy? <laughs> is it a why question? I can only answer whys. No, it's a do question. I shall accept that. <laughs> so, do you like zombies? Uh, no, you don't like zombies. Uh, why you don't like zombies? Because zombies are such <laughs> obnoxious overdone, overrated fad, they need to die 
<laughs> again <laughs> because they're <laughs> undead. I have been sick and tired of zombies since high school of the dead, and that was back in 2007. They have never stopped. The zombie outbreak scenario, it's been done to the death yeah. and the undeath and beyond. Yeah. Yeah, the only However, interesting thing they can find is just for you gotta find new interesting takes on it, whether it be the over the top nature of Dead Rising. However, I don't usually recommend zombie shows to people, but I do recommend to go out and see Raised by Zombies. Why? Because it's really good. In spite of itself, it's really good. In spite of it having to do with a post-apocalyptic world filled with flesh-eating zombies and the last vestiges of humanity trying to survive, the narrative framing of the story, the aesthetics, and also the presentation makes it feel unique, original, and special. Which is more than I can say about literally everything else having to do with the zombies. <laughs> yeah. This is one that I've recently watched over the years. Like, for one of my last jobs, basically my job is basically to find each and every episode and basically gauge if they can go up on the website I was de developing. So I had to watch All Raised by Zombies. And it definitely is exactly what you said. It's a much more unique take on it. The best way I can describe it is, if people watch Fantasia, it's basically like the musical version of the zombie outbreak. It's an interesting way of putting it, because every single episode, which they tend to be about uh, between, on average, three to five minutes long, um, every episode is basically sort of a music video. There are no dialogues, there are no sound effects. There's just music that accompanies a very unique style of animation, because yes, it is yet another animated series. This one by Guy Collins. I've only recently discovered Guy Collins. I wish I did sooner, because I <laughs> bear witness to the absolute glory that is Kaizo Trap. <laughs> so good. And to think he's doing all of this, all of this uh, really high quality animation using uh, Adobe Premiere 2007. That's impressive. Wow, 2007, yeah, that is yeah. impressive indeed. Yes. Raised by Zombies is a frame by frame animation. Every episode, like I said, is uh, three, four, five minutes long, there is music, no dialogues and no sound effects, but it still tells a pretty compelling, a surprisingly uh, involving story mm -hmm. that essentially almost plays out like uh, any other zombie outbreak scenario, but... Uh, it is framed in such a way that uh, it uh, manages to shine with its own uh, unique elements mm -hmm. that uh, make it different, including the choice for a main character, or should I say main characters, compelling backstory, drama, comedy, <laughs> animal <Yeah>. sidekicks, <laughs> it has yeah. everything, and it's yeah. fun. Yeah, and it's moving. The key point of this whole show, unlike a lot of the other zombie shows and all that, Last of Us, Dead Rising and all that, 
raised by zombies, hits at the emotional center of the zombie outbreak without using any dialogue, without using any sound effects and such. It has that sort of fun atmosphere with all the little animal sidekicks and all that, and the little, little cute little girl and all that. Okay, I have to say, the animal sidekicks really threw me off in the early goings yeah. of the show, especially since uh, I did not have the context of uh, the main character's backstory in mind. That definitely made me intrigued. Yeah. In fact, uh, I was just left uh, wondering why are all those animal sidekicks just specifically helping out the main character? Mm -hmm. Is she a Disney princess or something? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it feels like that's sort of the, the purpose of that certain episode. It's, it's, it's to so show off, weirdly show off whimsical, it. considering it's a zombie outbreak scenario. You know? Yeah, you, yeah, you really never see, you never have the word whimsical describe any sort of zombie outbreak. It is different, though. <laughs> yeah, it, ma it makes you smile, just like, oh yeah, this is, the, this is the good part. All the animal sidekicks, all the little cute little girl and all that, before you go into the more depressing stuff further down the storyline. There is a very specific element about this show that made me say, this is good. OMG. I'm enjoying a zombie show. Who would have thought? <laughs> and that element is the two main characters. Mm -hmm. Specifically the girl and her mother. And I'm going to have to spoil this to you, unfortunately, to make you understand why this works in so many levels. The mother is and undead. <laughs> but, for some reason, she's not completely gone. She is not like the other zombies. She has retained her memories, she has retained herself. She's simply not able to communicate in a human sense, but mm -hmm. she's still very much herself. So now we have this girl who has mysterious powers that clearly relate to this very peculiar turn of events concerning her mother and also her father mm -hmm. and also the animal sidekicks, I can only assume. <laughs> and she's traveling alongside her zombie mom. Raised by zombies is probably the only, the only Hordes of the Undead related show that I feel confident recommending to anyone, especially to those who are sick and tired of the zombies, because this is just an all-around engaging story with uh, compelling characters told in a very minimalistic way. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the fact that it has zombies in it. Yeah, so, I would be right there behind you. Like, this is probably one of my favorite online series of all time. Oh, you, you, Rapscallion, you had me there. You're not behind <laughs> me. <laughs> uh. Or am I? Mm. Now I'm invisible behind you, too. Oh, wow, you're invisible and omnipresent. Exactly. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> okay. Oh, God. That's how that works. There is only one god, and that's Osamu Tezuka, god of manga. <laughs> so these are our recommendations and analytical reviews of shows or cartoons and various other animations you can find for free on the Tube U. The YouTube. <laughs> the YouTube. <laughs> Um, we might do more of this podcast specifically talking about uh, animations available for free and it is also a good way to promote uh, young uh, up-and-coming animators yeah. and they definitely deserve visibility. By the way, the show it is also not exactly in black and white, more like in uh, aqua blue and white. Yeah. It has this very interesting color scheme, which uh, it's almost evocative of a uh, relaxing. Yeah. 
uh, scenario, okay. which is the opposite of what uh, uh, the show would entail mm -hmm. in that regard. It's almost like the feeling of sitting out in the sun <laughs> and just letting the breeze hit you, even though that's a shambling zombie he's right behind it. Well, they are shambling, so you have all the time to, you know, stand up and move to another spot on the beach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just hope zombie mom doesn't die because she's best mom. <laughs> yeah. My gosh. Uh, so uh. nice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess that's it for tonight. Uh, thank yeah. you for uh, listening to us. Editing this podcast is going to be a nightmare for me because during the uh, whole Doodle Toons debacle, I flubbed almost every of my lines. <laughs> it was surprisingly hard was, to talk about that yeah, for definitely. some reason. Maybe it's the heat that's getting on my head. But regardless, <laughs> we'll be seeing you next time for more excitement and podcasting and podcasting excitement Ooh. with your friends Mad Dog Die Master and Y Boy Thy the boy. boy of many questions <laughs> my boy boy <laughs> If you ever get the chance to watch Phantasm. <laughs> boy! My boy. My god. Oh, since we're doing this, everybody's so stupid. <laughs> we should do an entire podcast dedicated to Dingo Pictures. No. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye. There's a beautiful day Headed your way Keep your head up, up, up You'll be okay